Welcome to Book Tour, two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. This episode, we're going to be talking about The Labyrinth of Dolls by Craig Walwork, which is a follow-up to the book that we uh, kicked our year off with, which is uh, the the first in the Tom Nolan book series, Bad People, which was also um, the inaugural use of our new rating system. There's a whole, we kicked off our year, we kicked off the rating system with uh, with that Bad People book, and so this is... Uh, the follow-up less than a year uh, uh, later. Yeah, nine months later. Um, it's a pretty quick turnaround for Mr. Wallwork to turn out another book. Uh, I'll be honest, we're probably only doing this sequel because we love Craig so much. I don't know. Reviewing sequels is tough because there's like things that... How do I say this? So when you're reading the second book, there's things you know that we can't talk about. So like in the first book, we could talk about everything that took us into the book, right? It's this time we, we can't so much. So it becomes a little tricky. Yeah. It, um, and so like that, that should serve as a bit of a, a spoiler. If you haven't read the, uh, the original book, we'll probably talk about things that go into spoilers. I don't think we're going to actually spoil the first book, but um, there's some things that get talked about that just, you know, are very revelatory to the, the original story. So um, just bear that in mind. Uh as a point of reference, when we reviewed that book, uh, overall, we gave it a rating of 8.63. So it was highly recommendable. Um, so if you're interested in reading Labyrinth of Dolls, which means you're, you're interested in reading a bad people, I'd say maybe pick this, uh, this review up after you got through that book. Nothing like, see, that's, that's the thing about us. We're telling people like, don't listen, go back. Read a different book, come back and listen. So, yeah. at any rate, um, uh, do you want to do this bio since you're the creator of it? Yeah. I, so recently, uh, in preparation for this, I went and I re-listened to our Bad People review, and um, one of the things that we talked about was that he doesn't have a bio um, on Amazon, and that's usually where we pull our bios from because it's easy, a copy and paste kind of situation. I didn't look in the actual like ebook that he provided with us. So maybe um, Livius can check that out. But um, what I did was I went to, since we've had Craig on the podcast multiple times in the past, um, I went to one of the older episodes and I found um, a bio that he had provided and then I just updated it with the most recent stuff. So here's a little bit about Craig. Lives in West Yorkshire, England. He's the author of the short story collections Quintessence of Dust and Gory Hole and the novels To Die Upon a Kiss, The Sound of Loneliness, and Bad People. His fiction has appeared in various anthologies, journals, and magazines, including the Booked Anthology, and he was fiction editor at Medicine Hedge Magazine at the time that that bio was written. Um, I would like to say there is a bio in the Kindle edition, but yours is better. <laughs> Uh, which is cool. And I was actually, when I was putting this bio together, it occurred to me, Livius, you've read everything that he's written, except for maybe that gory hole collection, right? Um, I actually, oh, I feel like gory hole maybe had four stories and I think I read two. Okay. So yes, I essentially, yes. That's crazy. So you're like mm -hmm. very knowledgeable about his, his writing. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but, um, on my, uh, on my like lower back, like kind of towards my hip, I actually have a tattoo of Craig Wallwork. Hmm. Yeah, that's creepy. Yeah, next time I'm bending over, pick something up. Maybe you'll maybe you'll notice it. So. Oh, sweet lord! <laughs> I don't even know what here to think is, about that. <laughs> here is the synopsis. <laughs> Here's the synopsis for Labyrinth of Dolls. Evil has a new face. It's been one year since the horrific murders of Stormer Hill, and the events of that time continue to resonate with Detective Constable Tom Nolan. In an attempt to find the second killer, known only as the Ragman, Nolan joins West Yorkshire's murder investigation team. Partnered with Jennifer Morrison, a straight-talking detective with her eye on promotion, the two officers are assigned to track down a new killer whose victims are all found dressed like human dolls. As the investigation progresses, Nolan becomes an intricate piece in the killer's grand vision that puts his life in danger. But with the body count rising daily and the pressure to find who the media is labeling the doll maker increasing, Nolan discovers more than just a series of grisly murders. Wait, there was bears that got murdered too? Oh, grisly. That's not like... I didn't oh. see it was with an S, not some Zs. Yeah. Um, it's like, did I read the right book? It's going to be a long episode between the two of us at this point, I think. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, this picks up, uh, and we'll probably reference back to things that happen in bad people, uh, now and again during the, the conversation, but, um, picks up a little bit later on. Uh, one thing that I'm going to say about this synopsis, which I'm not saying is wrong, but I'm just going to say, I didn't get the impression of this was, um, it says in an attempt to find the second killer, he joins the murder investigation team. And I didn't think that that was his intent when he joined the murder investigation team. Didn't he just apply for a job? Basically. Uh, I am with you on this. I thought okay. the same thing. Okay, cool. And maybe it just, it maybe it's just kind of written in passing in the book, but emphasized in the synopsis possibly more. I don't know, but yeah, it wasn't my mm-hmm. impression when I read the book. Um, but obviously a very minor detail that doesn't matter too much. Yeah. I like the synopsis. I think it's, uh, it, you know, with that, perhaps that exception. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not bad. I, I, I like it. Um, so yeah, we kick off as the synopsis says, uh, almost exactly, uh, one year close to a year, um, since the, the date of, uh, for anybody who didn't read bad people, you should, but essentially Tom Nolan was um, involved in an investigation that involved a number of missing children. Uh, as, as most books uh, of this crime mystery type, there is somewhat of a resolution at the end. And that's what's referred to as the events of uh, or the horrific murders of Stormer Hill. So, again, as Rob mentioned, we might be referring back to that. But Tom has taken his time off and his uh, his therapy and whatever else he needed to do to get square and has uh, applied uh, from what I get like a like a I feel like it's a town that's close, right? I don't know anything mm-hmm. about West Yorkshire, but I get the feeling like it's in a nearby area, not necessarily like just a different division in the same right like town like in a ca- like the county over or something like that. Yep. Yeah. So again, anybody who's intimate with the uh, geography of England can can correct us on that. Um, so yeah, he gets uh, immediately uh, put on a case uh, that's a that's a weird one. He's kind of dragged along by his boss on the first day of work to the uh, to the morgue where kind of a weird body has turned up, and that body is uh, made up and, and dressed up to look like a like a doll. So he's immediately taken from you know. <sighs> leave essentially from one bizarre string of missing children that you know that that got even weirder led directly to another weird case on on day one in his new gig yeah and it was actually a nice way to start the book because um i think the first like actual chapter is the discovery of the body and then it cuts back to to tom's story and picks up where where he is in the present day but basically like um a maid is showing up for work uh, to her very like particular um, uh, bosses, it's a single woman, and she shows up and she goes through like starting her normal routine, and discovers the body, and it's very macabre and and stuff like that. Uh, and then it jumps over to the stuff that Livius just said. Um, but like the description of of the way that the body appeared and stuff was interesting because you know covered in um, like white paint, like was it like clown kind of paint, like face paint kind of stuff, whatever that's called. Yep. And um, the description of, of discovering the body was was a great way to kick it off because it's like um, you you just read a book about this character and then um, this is something that's completely unrelated. Uh, so like this is the way of, of demonstrating, hey, this new like he's not out of the shit. There's something big and crazy that's happening right from the beginning. So this is not a judgment on this book, but it just occurred to me that in any type of story where like, you know, body is found in some kind of weird situation, like never. And I'll use this book as an example. Not one person's like, maybe this is just how she was kind of kinky. Like, this is how she dressed, <laughs> you know, like, like she would just dress up with like white grease paint and, and, and try to make herself up like a kind of weird adult doll and dress that way. Like when she was at home, like no one ever thinks that's it. They're like, the killer must have done this. And to be fair, the, the killer did do it in this one. I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that, but it's a little odd that nobody ever's like, man, maybe, maybe it's just a little kinky. That would be especially all right. So the thing we didn't describe is the fact that like her, the back of her head is caved in basically. So it's obvious that someone bashed her skull in, but mm-hmm. like now I want to follow Livius's narrative where basically like she 
is dressed up like her weirdo doll and someone com- comes over just to kill her. She just happened to be dressed that way. Yeah. There you go. Listen, we've got to we've got to make this movie where oh, the basically <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, where the detectives just get well, I, I've seen, so I'm I'm thinking back. I know we're completely off ga- off path, but um, Boondock Saints, how the the detectives were always oh, like yeah. completely off of what happened, like yeah, like that, <laughs> but with serial killer. Yeah, that would be yeah, that would be interesting. So, um, so he's kind of dragged into this. He's you know he goes to the the morgue where they're doing the autopsy, and of course more details are are revealed there. But he's immediately after that partnered with Jennifer Morrison. Um, again mentioned in the synopsis who's a, a woman who's also a detective but uh, she didn't seem too fond of of, of picking up um, Tom as a partner now I again and I don't know how explicit it was in the book but everybody knows about Tom and everybody knows that he was uh, one of the detectives on the Stormer Hill case and everybody knows his outcome so in a lot of instances there you know are likely people to be you know, tiptoeing around him or leery of working with him. So she definitely appears to be leery um, of working with him, at least at first. So where the case starts to to gain momentum is um, something was left behind by the killer in a way that I guess I'll just let the reader discover. Um, but it's a music box and the music box plays a specific song. And um, this is where Nolan's detective uh, acumen, I guess, kind of becomes highlighted because based on the music box and and um, the other clues that they had or information they had about the killing, um, he's able to figure out um, where the next body is going to be or like he has a good idea that the next place they have to go for information is the specific person's place. Um, and they go uh, follow up his hunch or lead or whatever you want to call it. And um, that's when they discover a second body. And so this kicks off. This isn't just an isolated murder that they were, you know, getting clues that they would solve. This is a series of murders. And uh, uh, as as time goes on, like he's obviously the one of the two between him and Morrison that's really keyed into or clued into what's going on and and there is even like the typical um which which you see a lot i think in tv like cops not wanting to rock the boat too much but then also cops trying to not get the credit like steal the credit or not get the credit stolen from them for the things they're doing so there's a lot of cop politics stuff going on but like a lot of good detective work happening as well it's interesting that you mentioned the cop politics stuff, because I really <clears throat> went down a little bit of a thought rabbit hole on that and wondered if it's really if it, you know, if it's really like that. And I guess like anything else, like any job, right, you've got people who want all the credit and people who just don't care. You know what I mean? Who don't care. You know, they just care that the job gets done. But I did find that little bit of, uh, you know, animosity around those parts kind of interesting. Yeah, I've always had the impression that like at least from like cop stories and stuff that there's a whole like um, uh, perception is reality situation uh, with the cops that has a lot of impact on how successful you have the possibility of being. Yeah. It's weird. I do want to break off since, since we did mention that I also want to say, and and I, I don't know how intimate Craig is with, with the law, right? Meaning like police, but it did seem like <clears throat> all of the parts that that dealt with police procedure and stuff. Now, I don't know shit about it, so it could have been he just made it up even poorly and I just bought it all. But it all felt like really well researched, right? Like it felt like you were listening to, you know, even like all the abbreviations and stuff that were used. It, it felt pretty legit as a, as a police procedural. Yeah, I'll agree. I think it was um, – I would go so far as to say that it was maybe – a step beyond what I'm trying to think of the best way to say this because it's not a bad thing. It was just, I observed that it seemed like it was more almost inside talk than talk that would be uh, accessible to the general public. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, like if I was talking at length about, you know, my job, (laughs) you didn't know half of what I was saying, like wandering into that territory. Yeah. Yeah. I can I can agree with that. 
I mean, I, I always felt like I knew what was going on, but yeah, you're right. There were, there were sentences that I didn't, I did understand, but I got like the general gist of the direction, like the investigation. Yeah. And you can going, typically so. like, yeah, from context, pick up the clues and figure out what he was saying for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I think maybe the last thing we'll, we'll say on plot is, uh, and, and it's in the synopsis, but it doesn't take too long, um, for this to, uh, to turn into a story where we know and Tom knows that some of the clues are directed specifically at him. And I think that's probably a fair, a fair way to put it. Do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah. More so than he would hope. It's obviously like it's, it's, it's time so that it's soon enough that he's still trying to put it in his past. So like, you know, uh, the, the, the Stormer Hill, the previous book stuff, so like getting personally dragged into a new investigation is probably like the last thing he wants. So the fact that it's happening all over again kind of is not something he's excited about, but uh, it's uh, happening whether he likes it or not. And through all of this, his relationship, and I'm not saying that in a romantic way, but his uh, relationship with his partner continues to develop in a way that I thought was actually um, pretty well done. When I say that, I mean... Um, a lot of times, especially in cop books, right? Like if there's a man and a woman, it's going to head down that romantic path, or at least that's my experience in reading the, this type of, of fiction. <clears throat> so that's not what I'm saying in this one. I just, I, I like the fact that their relationship uh, continued to advance throughout the course of the book. I'll, I'll agree with that. Um, so since we can't really go too much further with plot, um, there's a couple of observations I'd like to make. And since I re- recently re-listen to our review of bad people it's more fresh in my mind but um, one of the things that was um, specifically called out by both me and Livius in the bad people review was that the book was set up in a way where it was kind of ambiguous who the protagonist was and so as that book went on suddenly you're like oh wait maybe I'm following the wrong person here and then eventually Tom kind of emerges as the overall protagonist Whereas in this one, since the story's already been established and we know the character and everything, it's it's like it's it's familiar faster, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So um, that's definitely a different difference between the first book and the second book. Not saying one is better than the other, but like we're benefiting from all the work that was done in the first book um, to have an easier time with the plot in the second book. I agree wholeheartedly, and I'm glad that you said so that we did indicate that in our review, right? I did not go back yeah. and listen to our review. Okay, because I know I was thinking it. You and I actually had a conversation um, off podcast about it, so I, I know I was thinking it. I just couldn't remember if at the if I was accurate about thinking it at the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're probably going to head over to spoiler talk because then we can kind of organize our thoughts on what we can and can't talk about in the remainder of this book. Um, and come back and do that and give this a rating. So spoiler talk happens over at patreon.com slash booked, um, where for $2 a month, you can hear our thoughts on the rest of and the ending of this book in explicit, explicit detail, typically. Um, so we're going to go do that now. For you, it won't take but a second. Um, but we're going to spend 10, 15 minutes and talk about Labyrinth of the Dolls. All right, we are back from spoiler talk. We got a few things off of our chest, clarified a few things, and... Um... Probably are going to roll into wrap ups in a second here. Here's what I'm going to say. I just want to give a general impression of really liked the the first book, Bad People, and I think it was a great way to kick off establishing a good foundation for what this book was. And in my impression, and I'll probably go in a little bit more detail in in the wrap up. I think Craig gave himself a great opportunity to show just the type of story he could write because this was absolutely. Um, just a lot of fun. It was very exciting. Like every time something new happened, that was a twist. I was like, go off, buddy. Show me what you got next. So um, I like the fact that um, you can have an author start a series and do series work that isn't just series for the sake of being a series, that it actually allows him to expand and kind of explore the possibilities of writing a story. Well said. Um, Can we talk about the fact that he's really British? You mean really British or that he's actually British? <laughs> well, like, like he's like, super British. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to go with super British on this one. And the, the line that struck me the most, and, and there's a lot of, so if anybody isn't familiar with, um, 
with British crime stuff. Um, they're, they're det- it's uh, DCI is Detective of Criminal Investigation, maybe, right? So there's a lot of you know DCI this person and DCI that person, and you know you get used to it pretty quickly. There's one line, and it says he was no longer in Kansas anymore. That just struck me as super British. <laughs> Like, I almost wonder <laughs> if there is a British version of The Wizard of Oz that's, you know. <laughs> I don't think we're in Kansas uh, any longer, Toto. That's like the um, Steve Buscemi where he's like, look, he's dressed up like a kid. How are you doing, fellow kids? Or whatever he says. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, that line absolutely stuck out to me. Well, I didn't know that's what you're going to call out, but I, yep. I, I stopped and I read that line like three times and I was like... <laughs> Oh, that hurts. I do want to correct you. I think it's Detective Chief Inspector is the CI part. Oh, yep. I think I think you're right. Chief Inspector, Detective Chief Inspector. Luther. So I always think of when I hear DCI, it should just be Luther right after it. <laughs> Did you imagine Idris Elba playing every character in this uh, book? Uh, yes, I tried. The, the male characters, the female characters, they were just all Idris Elba. <laughs> the Tom Nolan one was like a little overweight, a little past his prime. The music yeah. box looked like Idris Elba. Yes. Yes, the music box. Let's not talk about the music box any longer before I start Google searching stuff again. Um, let's uh, let's go into wrap-ups. Shall I, or would you like to go first? Yeah, go for it. All right. I also really enjoyed Bad People, which um, I will mention again. I know Rob mentioned it at the top. was our first review of the year and the first review under our new rating system. So it helped shape um, how we... Great books. Now, there would have been some slight changes since that one as we work out, you know, some of the kinks in the rating system. Um, but this is a great follow up. So um, we we move very quickly into the action in this one, even though there's a year in between. Um, like we get right back into the story and there's not a look. A lot of authors could have spent three or four chapters on, on getting Nolan um, back to the office. And Walwork chose not to, which is absolutely terrific. Um, this was a very well plotted out, um, I don't want to say like murder mystery, but like a crime procedural, like there were just enough twists and turns to keep you interested. All of it made sense. I didn't get hung up on on anything, um, in particular in the story, which can happen a lot in these types of stories. So I think he did a great, great job there. I like the characters and the character interaction. Like I said, I particularly like the relationship between Tom Nolan and Jennifer Morrison, his partner. I thought that was very well written. And I already mentioned that I liked um, the procedural aspect, right? So the banter back and forth between cops about what was the next step and all that good stuff. Um, It's a short book. And I felt like almost the pace was too fast. So that's a little bit of of something that... um, and and maybe Rob will chime in during during his wrap up on this, but I, I thought we could have slowed it down just a hair. But other than that, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed this book. I uh, I am very interested to see if there's another Tom Nolan book where this goes. Like super super interested. So uh, all that being said, when I total up all the scores and average them out, it comes out to an eight point two five. A quite enjoyable crime book. All right, before I forget to say it, I'm going to start out my wrap-up by saying that this is probably the best use of eyeballs in a story since the movie The Crow. Uh, All right, I like that. So definitely want to point that out. Um, There's nothing we can say in the book review because it spoils stuff, but um, eyeballs. So if you have a fear of weird eyeball stuff, you might want to stay away from this book Um, or maybe use this book to overcome your fear. Who knows? Um, Everything Livia said. I think it was a very tightly written, well plotted, mystery detective type story, um, and it did do the kind of thing the first one did, 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 which was to blend a primarily crime story with an element of horror. Um, obviously, this one may be a little bit more grounded in reality than we were led to believe the first one was. Either way, um, very, very well done. Um, he, I believe, because he had already had that foundational approach, um, setting every, everything up in the first book, had the opportunity to just um, really spread his wings more and, and do more more clever writing uh, this time around and showcase what he's capable of doing as an author. I thought it was a great book. Uh, very enjoyable. There was uh, maybe 
one minor thing that I, I would dig him for that I talked about in spoiler talk that I already forgot what it was. That's how inconsequential it was, but it did come up. Um, overall, this is, I would say, probably the best thing I've ever read from Craig Wallwork, and I love him writing crime detective stuff with kind of a, a horror bent to it. So if 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 we don't get a third book in the Tom Nolan series, I hope we get more like this anyway. Overall, my this is weird. This doesn't really happen as much anymore since we started this new rating system. Um, I have the exact same score as Livius. It's 8.25 out of 10, which is an average of 8.25 for this. For Obviously, we all know how math goes. I, I love the way that he writes stuff in a way that it's always approachable, but he takes those moments where it's just a little bit more poetic and and um, profoundly written than you would imagine in like a like a crime detective story. So I think that worked in his favor. Loved the way that the conclusion played out. You'll have to excuse. I think there's like a ton of cars race dragging outside my window right now. So if that came through, I apologize. Um, the way that the the ending played out with the twists and the turns I loved. And every time a twist happened, I was like, Oh, give me more of this. So that's definitely a benefit of that. And um, yeah, overall I thought it really worked well. So like I said, 8.25 good stuff. Um, Yeah. So if anything you heard was to your liking, um, you can pick up bad people um, anytime, right? So it's available now. Um, By the time you're hearing this, Labyrinth of the Dolls will be available at least in Kindle format. So I'm not sure if there's going to be a paper release of that. You can order a paperback of bad people for a very reasonable $8.99 on Amazon in the U.S. And whatever that translates to in prices in whatever country you're in. So if you're down for it, by the time you're hearing this, both should be available. And uh, yeah, it's worth your time. They're short books. Spend a few hours. Catch a good story. And since we always ask people to read our stuff, like the way that... Uh, especially like smaller independent authors uh, are able to continue doing their stuff is by getting ratings and reviews as well. So like if you read it, you like it, rate it, give it a review somewhere, but do that for anything. Like if you're reading it as a reader, if you enjoy a book, like the best thing you can do for the author is there's two things. You can write a review and you can pre-order or order what else, whatever else they have. So just, uh, yeah, that's what you can do to, to help your your favorite authors continue to be your favorite authors. Well said. What else we got, Rob? I think it took us like nine and a half years to say that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're doing our well, part. That's, that's enough, right? Well, that's yeah. Like I feel bad when I don't go do like an Amazon review for something. But I'm like, God damn it! Which one of these motherfuckers spent an hour talking about this book on their podcast? Like yeah. you know, the people who wrote the review. So I always kind of feel like like yes, we've we've done our part. I actually can't. This is a. I don't know if I told you this, but I can't review books on Amazon. Like they take them down because I have an Amazon author page from when we made the the anthology. Oh, that's. I think I do feel like you mentioned that. That's so weird. Yeah, I tried to review a Keaton book, David James Keaton book, and uh, that was the first review, and it went up. I even took a screenshot so I could show David, "Hey, I reviewed your thing," and then the next day it was gone. I um. It's kind of interesting, and and I say this, like it's 2020. Like, who hasn't written a book at this point, right? That's the like, thing. Yeah, yeah. I feel like they're cutting out a big swath of people, and you know who for sure reads books? People who write books. I happen to yeah. know that for a fact. Yeah, yeah. That's wild. That's like it, when you go to like an open mic night. Half the people there are improv people in the audience and on the stage. Like, yeah. Come on. Like, and then, like, what if James Patterson wrote a, a review of a book? Would they be like, nope, you're an author? No, I guarantee the James Patterson review would stay. So this is just yeah. some elitist bullshit. I uh, I have to agree. Do you think that holds true for Goodreads? I mean, I know it's an Amazon company, but since you don't actually buy books through Goodreads, I wonder if that's the same. Um, I personally have no problem putting reviews up. But, yeah, I, I would imagine that it's different because it's, like, it's just more community and discussion-based. I would yeah. think is it a sales base? I can see where you'd want to like not inflate like you're an author and you got 40 author friends. Suddenly you've got 40 reviews. Like that's a little shitty, yeah. but I'm a book reviewer that can't review books. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. 
Well, now I know that I can always use that and be like, oh yeah, bro, I can't. Yeah, sorry, just man. Can't Amazon just takes them down. I'd love, to, I'd love to review your entire catalog, but yeah, not, not, can't do it. What's that? You want us? You want us to talk about it on the podcast? Oh man, our calendar is full. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, all right. So here's what I'll say. I'm such a dummy sometimes. So I'm at work, and without going too far into what I do for a living, there's a woman in my place of work that's holding a book in her hand, which is an odd thing to see where I work. And I happen to catch a, a glimpse at the cover and at the name, and the name sounds interesting, and the cover sounds interesting. I go, oh, hey, <clears throat> what you got there? <clears throat> so she tells me, she's like, oh, this is my book. I wrote this book. And I said, oh, do you, do you mind if I take a look? And, you know, it's self-published, but it's it's high quality. It's got the nice, uh, it's got the cover, the first um, edition of the book uh, anthology had. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, so I flip it over and I read the synopsis and, and you know, it's, it's a period piece and it sounds kind of interesting. And I go, oh, this is uh, this is really nice. And I, I hand it back to her and I don't remember what she said. And I said, oh, I said, I, I, I review books. And I thought, why the fuck did you just say that out loud to somebody who wrote a book? Why would you do that? That's because, the worst possible thing. Like. Yeah. 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 So, at any rate, it didn't turn into her asking me to review it, but, you know, she said, well, you know, if you get a chance to check it out, you know, let me know what you think. Well, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I will. I said, you know, calendar's pretty full. I said, we're trying to hit like 40 books a year. And she's like, wow, that's a lot. And I said, yeah. And I thought, oh, God. But yeah, it just, it just <laughs> came out of my mouth. And I can't, why didn't I just say, yeah, I just read a lot? Because that would also be accurate. So, dude, um, where I work, also retail. Um, there was a period of time where my coworkers, if so, like when they're talking to customers, if, if like the writing or, or books came up, they'd be like, Oh, we have a, we have someone who works here who does a podcast. He reviews books and they'd want to talk to me. And I'd be like, Oh God, just no, please. I, I had to tell everybody, like, don't tell people I have a podcast where I review books. I don't want anybody to know that. Like that's up to me to tell people. So, yeah. I, I'm my own worst enemy, but at, at a former location that I worked at, I actually had a customer come in, ask for me, and then was told that one of my coworkers told them I do a podcast and had questions about doing a podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, the amount of people yeah. I've I've advised yeah. on doing podcasts over the years is insane. It's but, weird. Um, like, there's a total stranger who came back and they said, hey, so-and-so said that you do a podcast. <laughs> and, you know, I'm looking at this person. I'm like, what, what the fuck is this conversation? Like, they asked for me by name, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> right. all right. They're like, I was just wondering. And I remember they had some mundane questions or whatever. And I, you know, I helped them out the best I could. But just, it was just, uh, it's weird. That's the weird thing I think about having like hobbies or passions in general. Um, because I'm also the guy, I've had people who are like high up in the company be like, hey, I have to give a gift to someone. What bourbon should I buy them? So the fact that like I'm known as like the, a bourbon guy or a craft beer guy. I get those questions too. So it's just like, if you're like perceived to be any type of expert on a topic, um, especially one that people aren't as frequently experts in, like you're just the, you're like the Wikipedia of that specific topic for them. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Listen to us patting ourselves on the back. For oh all the yeah. Knowledge we have. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> the burden of our, yeah. our, our tough lives, knowing things. Good. Lord, but yeah, so that happens. If you do a podcast, don't tell people you do a podcast. Definitely don't tell them what you do it on. If you tell them you do a podcast, and if you have a drinking problem, don't tell them that either. The <laughs> well, the, the flip side, maybe we're doing this wrong though, because I can think of the people who are like they talk about it so much they just beat you over the head about it until you don't want to hear about it anymore. So maybe we're doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. We need to we need to over talk up the podcast to the point where people are like, oh, fucking enough already. Yeah, no shit. Try that. Let me know how it goes for you. Yeah. <laughs> Working from home is not going to help that. No. <laughs> Just knocking on the on the wall right to your neighbor. You're like, yeah, sure about my podcast. I, I do a podcast. I don't know if that came through as me talking through a wall or not, but <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So um, next week we have. So I, I this next book I, I laugh because I uh, I just typed in the name of it on Kindle and came up with just a wealth of discussion worthy stuff that I'm not going to discuss. But 
um, if, if you have some free time, go to Amazon, type in the word standalone oh, and then just read through the first like 10 results, read the synopses and stuff. It's there's some, there's some bangers out there. So standalone by Paul Michael Anderson, uh, another short book, but this one is, uh, this one seems uh, pretty interesting. It, ca- it comes to us via perpetual motion machine publishing. Um, as you guys uh, may remember, uh, we reviewed a book of theirs not that long ago. Yeah. Uh, that was the Michael David Wilson girl in the video. Mm-hmm. I was thinking it was the Max Booth uh, test oh, tonight. You know what? I was thinking the same thing. I was, I was like, oh, there's two, but that's yes, you're right because that's but a cemetery, he's cemetery dance. dance yep. Yeah, yep. So, oh, but, it's so incestuous out there. That's well. Uh, that's I think that's a, the byproduct of us trying to like expand our horizons a little bit. We had a conversation really recently where um, I don't know if I don't think it was on the podcast, but about how. We don't want to get stuck reading like the same stable of like reliable authors. We still want to kind of like explore and, and discover new stuff. And when we pick up one new author, then that hits the dominoes for all of like the the associated authors. And that's what this is. This is um, if we didn't read the Max Booth book, we wouldn't have gotten to Paul Michael Anderson standalone. So it's nice to have that kind of branching out um Instead of keeping it like we don't want a Habsburg's jaw, Habsburg jaw of uh, of podcasting, of book reviewing. Mm-hmm. It's all throwback reference. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll give you guys the um, because this one uh, we're going to be a little late on because this also comes out this week. But we had like a pile of books to review that were all due on this. They're not due, but we're all coming out on the same date. So here's the synopsis for Standalone. They are killers. They are monsters. They are evil. They stalk through summer camps, abandoned hospitals, run down schools, and isolated houses, hunting anyone foolish enough to visit these places, leaving behind carnage, terror, death, and destruction. Sometimes there are survivors. Always there is blood. And they do it to protect and preserve all of existence across the multiverse. So let that sit for a second. But now they are the ones being stalked and hunted, and life as we know it hangs in the balance unless they figure out a way to survive. So definitely an interesting premise. Um, I'm very much looking forward to, to, to reading this one. Uh, depending on how busy my night is, I might finish reading it tonight. I started reading earlier today, and the actual so the book is interesting too because uh, the story itself clocks in just under 160 pages or so, but the book itself is about 30 or 40 more. So there's an extra short story at the end of it, and um, yeah, I'm about halfway through it right now, and um, it's going to be fun to talk about. <laughs> I am very much looking forward to it. Um, I don't think... Do you have anything else for tonight, Rob? No, this is a quickie. Um, I, I've been very boring lately, so there's not much... Uh, not, not, not super much. I'm hoping that... All right, here's one thing I'm going to acknowledge. In the Piranesi uh, review, I think it was the first one we recorded in my new place, in my new setup, and um, there was some weird echo because... I'm in a much bigger place, which with ha- which has much less stuff in it right now. There's another drag race happening outside, um, and so there was like an echo. And I'm, I'm adapting to the environment. And while I while I get set up, while I continue to get set up, I bought like a screen, um, like a sound dampening kind of thing. So hopefully that's helping. Hopefully that will improve my sound quality again. Get me back to to you know the sultry tones i'm usually at but in the meantime bear with me um i have a really cool setup right now it looks nice and everything and hopefully it's getting the job done subscribe on patreon if you want to give us (laughs) more money to buy (laughs) uh soundproofing (laughs) foam and stuff like that (laughs) rob needs more foam so um let's let's help him get that um, yeah, that's it. Next week, stand alone. Um, get the feeling we're going to hear an interview coming up in the next few weeks. So I don't want to, I don't want to guarantee that, but I, I get the feeling we'll do at least one or two interviews uh, here in September. And uh, that wraps it up for this episode of Booked. Until next time, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading.